Hello, beautiful souls. My name is Carolyn and I'm abnormal and I like to talk about abnormal things. Uh, I hope you're all doing amazing. And this channel is all about true crime, mystery, conspiracy theories, and anything abnormal. This story is about 11 year old double murderer, Mary Flora Bell. She was born May 29th, 1957, making her a Gemini. If you haven't heard the story before, it's a lot. It's definitely a lot because we are talking about an 11 year old double murderer. When I started looking into this case, I really thought, did this little girl ever have a chance? Uh, because unfortunately, as horrific as her crimes were, her childhood is almost as horrific. And this is a really good case of nature versus nurture. Was this little girl born the way she was or was she t taught to be this way? Mary was born in Corbridge, Northumberland, England to Elizabeth Betty Bell, who was only 17 at the time and she did already have another daughter. For most of Mary's life, she believed that William Billy Bell was her father. Billy and Betty got married when Mary was a baby. It is unknown who Mary's biological father was, but Billy was a violent, alcoholic, and habitual criminal who was not a great father figure for Mary. And it was reported when Mary was born the nurse, you know, Mary was born, the nurse took her, cleaned her up, wrapped her up, and went to hand her to Betty. And Betty famously said, get that thing away from me. And I really think this was a sign of what was to come. Because if you stick around and hear the rest of your story, that her saying that when Mary was born makes a lot of sense for who Betty was. And she was not a very good person. She was a terrible person, let's be honest. She was a horrible, horrific person. That's who Betty was. And Betty was the woman raising Mary. Mary's mother, Betty, was a well-known lady of the night who specialized in BDSM. She would bring clients to her home where Mary would witness the acts that were performed between Betty and her clients. At the age of four, Mary was forced to participate in these acts between Betty and her clients. And a lot of the family members believe that this started earlier than four, but it's confirmed that at four, she was performing these BDSM sex acts with Mary's clients. And I can't even imagine how a child would process something like that. Like, even if we go with four, a lot of family members believe it was younger than four, but four is kind of the confirmed number, so we'll stick with that. And she witnessed uh, choking, she witnessed abuse, and it was sexual gratification coming from inflicting pain on others. So what this would have done to a child that young is unimaginable. And not only did she witness these things, she was forced to participate in them. Mary had to perform these acts with Betty's clients. As a baby and young child, Mary suffered a lot of injuries when she was alone with her mother. And Betty, her mother, would always claim that these were injuries that Mary inflicted on herself. Betty once gave Mary a large number of sleeping pills and she had to be taken to the hospital, obviously. And Betty claimed that Mary had taken these pills herself, believing them to be candy. The family did not believe this. The family very much believed that the things that were being inflicted on Mary were being done to her by Mary. And the family believed that Betty was neglectful, and either attempting to harm or even kill Mary. In 1960, when Mary was three years old, Betty threw Mary from a second story window. Betty would claim that Mary 
fell or jumped out the window herself, but no one believed it. The family believed that Betty had intentionally tried to kill Mary. It's well documented in many sources that neighbors, friends, family members, teachers all knew of the horrific abuse that Mary was suffering at home at the hands of Mary. And I understand back in the late 50s, early 60s, I wasn't around back then, but I do know that back then it wasn't as common for people to report child abuse. People kind of had this belief that if it's happening in someone else's house, it's their business and I should stay out of it. And this is exactly what happened. And it was continuous through Mary's life. As you'll see, as the story goes on, all of these horrific things were happening. Everybody knew about it and nobody did anything to help Mary. Also in Mary's life, there were many times that Betty tried to give Mary away. One time she went to give her away at an adoption agency and there was a woman who wanted to adopt a baby and she was turned away by the adoption agency because she was un mentally unstable and not able to care for a child. And Betty was like, hmm, good opportunity. Here, you want Mary? You can have her. And family members then later were able to track down this woman and get Mary back. Betty also many times would give Mary to other family members and then change her mind and want Mary back. And it was kind of this continuous cycle of her giving her away, taking her back, and just a lot of instability was going on. On many occasions, when Mary was still a toddler, Betty would leave her home alone for sometimes days, even up to weeks at a time. A toddler being left home alone. Like, it's just absolutely insane. And Mary's father was no better. Billy was very rarely around. When he was around, he was always drunk and he was very abusive to both Mary and her mother, Betty. Both at home and in school, Mary exhibited very disturbing behavior at a very young age. She would get into fights with children at school. She was a bully. Uh, she would try to strangle other children. There was at one point she held a girl down, tried to strangle her and then shoved sand in her mouth, trying to block her trachea so she couldn't breathe. Um, it was just, she she was exhibiting all of these behaviors and so many people saw it and nothing, nothing was ever done. Mary was also a bedwetter, which is a definite sign of abuse. And not always, but I think in this case, it's pretty clear to say that it was because of abuse. But Mary was a, a, almost afraid to go to sleep at night because she was so afraid of wetting the bed. And the reason she was so afraid was because when she would wet the bed, the next morning, Betty would take her face and rub it in the urine soaked mattress. And it's said that Mary would hang her mattress out the window anytime Mary wet the bed so that the neighborhood would know and the other kids would know that Mary had wet her bed. To ridicule Mary and to make it known to everyone that Mary had wet the bed. And this was something she was very embarrassed of. And her mother just made everything worse. Mary's teachers all noted that she was a bully. They also said she was very intelligent, extremely clever, but she was most well known to teachers because of her sadistic side. She exhibited very sadistic behavior very early on in her life. And that obviously leads back to the acts that she was being forced to perform for Betty's clients. One of Mary's teachers recalled a time when Mary put out a cigarette on another child's face because that child received a better mark on a test than Mary did. And Mary admitted to it. Mary never tried to hide any of these horrific things that Mary does throughout the story, she always would admit to them. She never tried to hide things. She was very open 
and almost wanted attention for these things that she was doing. And the teacher took note of it, but as you'll see time and time again in this story, nothing was done to help Mary, to get her any type of help or any type of consequences when it went, came to the police or anything. She was just allowed to do these things and everyone took note of them, but no one took any action. On May 11th, 1968, Mary and her friend Norma took a three-year-old boy and told him they were taking him to get candy. The boy was found hours later bleeding and drugged, wandering the streets. The police were called, but again, no action was taken. No accountability, nothing was done. The next day, a mother in the neighborhood made a complaint to the Newcastle police that Mary had tried to strangle her daughter while Norma held her down. But again, no action was taken by anyone. And this 10 year old girl was clearly screaming out for help. And the police did absolutely nothing when she was exhibiting such dangerous, sadistic behavior. Like at this time, she's only 10 years old. And there's been so many times where the police have been notified of what Mary has been doing and they took absolutely no action. On May 25th, 1968, the day before Mary's 11th birthday, Mary found Martin Brown, who was four years old, playing outside. She asked him if he wanted to go with her to play a game. So Martin followed along and Mary took him to an abandoned building. She told him that he had a sore throat and she could make it better by rubbing it. Mary placed her hands around this four-year-old boy's neck and strangled the life out of him. She's believed to have committed this murder alone and the boy was found a few hours later by a workman. The police investigating his death found a pill bottle nearby his body. And at first it was believed that maybe this was something to do with his death. But after the autopsy, that was quickly ruled out as the cause of death. And his cause of death was determined to be natural causes. The police believe that he had died of fright that he was so afraid he died because he was afraid of heights because in the past one time he had fallen down the stairs. After Martin's death, Mary went to Martin's home and knocked on the door and Martin's mother answered the door and Mary asked to see Martin. And Martin's mother was aware that Mary knew he had died. So she was a little bit confused, but she was just sweet and said, sorry, you can't see Martin, he's died. And Mary very excitedly said, I know, I want to see him in his coffin. And his mother, shocked and horrified, who had just lost her four-year-old son, slammed the door in Mary's face. And Mary's this cruel side to Mary, she taunted these families. She would sometimes go to the door and say, knock on the door to speak to the mother and say, aren't you sad that Martin's died? Do you cry because Martin's died? And none of it was out of concern. It was all in a very taunting manner and she enjoyed it. It was like she was getting a thrill out of seeing the pain that she had inflicted on Martin's mother. She was very, very sadistic and very, very damaged. The days following Martin's murder, Mary went around to family members and friends at school and told them she had killed Martin, but no one believed her at the time. Mary drew a picture of Martin's body in the same position that he was found in and she drew a little bottle of pills to the side and had actually written tablets and showed a workman finding the body. 
And two days after Martin's death, there was a break-in at a nursery school and there were all these little pieces of paper found with different scribbles on it. One of the pieces of paper said, I murder so I can come back again. And another piece of paper said, we did murder Martin Brown, F off you bitch. And this was all in a child's handwriting. Police had found these notes, but just brushed them off as a childhood prank. And I don't know what kind of kid that that's a childhood prank that they do. Like, I don't know any kids that are writing, I murder so I can come back. Like how they just thought that was a childish prank to me, I don't understand. <laughs> Cause to me, that is absolutely not a childhood, normal childhood prank. Two months after Martin's death, Mary struck again, this time with her friend, Norma. Norma was two years older than Mary and Mary is now at this point 11 and Norma was 13. And Norma is always described as either slow or simple. And I don't know what kind of disability she had. I think saying slow or simple was how people would describe someone with learning disabilities at the time. Obviously those aren't terms that we use now, but um, I looked into trying to find out what exactly were Norma's disabilities because they do play into the story. Um, but I couldn't get a clear answer on exactly what she wa was, exactly what her disabilities were. She was basically in every source that I read, she's either described as slow or simple. Problematic terms, but these are the terms that were used at that time. And the public was not aware that there was a killer amongst them. Martin's death had been ruled as natural causes, so no one was expecting that there was a killer out there. They really believed that he had died of natural causes. Four-year-old Brian Howe was playing outside when Mary and Norma approached him and asked him if he wanted to come play with them, and they took him to a wasteland called Tin Lizzie. And one thing about this area where they were living at the time was there was a lot of abandoned buildings that were falling apart and should have been demolished, but they weren't. So they, were, they weren't safe areas for children to be playing in, but this is where a lot of the kids would go to play in these old abandoned buildings that just had not been torn down yet. When Brian was reported missing a few hours later, police found him half naked in a spread eagle position with a pair of scissors and a lock of his hair close to his body. Police found that he had been strangled. There were cuts on his legs, punctures to his calves, and cuts to his penis. And it's believed in an attempt to cut it off. This four-year-old little boy. There was also the letter M carved in his stomach and all of these cuts were later determined to be post-mortem, which I can only think is a good thing that this poor four-year-old little boy had already passed away when these injuries were inflicted on him. And I really think the fact that Mary tried to cut off his penis really indicates that this all stemmed from the abuse that she suffered, because that is what probably inflicted a lot of pain onto Mary. And obviously none of this abuse justifies the murder. I just found that part really interesting because how does an 11 year old think to do that? Like, I don't know how an 11 year old thinks to strangle someone. Um, but that to me was very clear that this all kind of stemmed from the abuse that Mary had suffered from her mother's clients. And at this point, no one had connected the two deaths. And one day when Brian's coffin was being carried out of his home, a police officer noticed Mary standing right at the front 
laughing, smiling, and like rubbing her hands together, like really excited. Like she was so excited. And this is the first time I think a police officer really started to think we need to look at Mary because the behavior she was exhibiting, she was telling on herself. She really was. It, it was, it, it, she made no attempts to hide anything that she did. And she exhibited so many of these behaviors being excited by what was going on. I mean, to everyone else in this community, they were all devastated. These two four-year-old boys had died. At this time, they only believed one of them had been murdered, but two four-year-old boys had died. And Mary was excited and Mary was happy. And these things, she got joy. She got excitement out of them. And that really shows how sick she really was. Police initially didn't realize that it was an initial carved onto Martin. And soon they realized that it was an initial carved into his stomach. And this is when they started to think that these acts had been committed by a child. And this is how they started to link the two murders together. Because until this point, they thought one was natural causes and one was murder. These two, these two crimes weren't connected. Police then held a press conference announcing that they were linking these murders and that they were looking for a child. And at this press conference, another police officer noticed Mary was at right front row. She was at the very, very front, listening on, eager, excited, so engaged in this police conference. And it seems like Mary really wanted to draw attention to herself. Police wanted to question her. And initially, Billy, her father, wouldn't let her be interviewed, but he eventually gave in and brought Mary down to the police station. By that time, police had spoke to a nine-year-old who had witnessed the strangling of Brian Howe. And when Mary was being interrogated, she very dramatically said, send for my solicitor. Not something you would expect an 11 year old to say, but nothing with Mary seems what you would expect from an 11 year old. After speaking to her teachers, the police had gone through her desk and her notebooks and they found a picture of Martin's body in the position in which he was found. There was also a picture of a little pill bottle with the word tablets written beside it. And the police knew that this was information that was never released to the public. The position of his body, the fact that there were pills found near his body, none of that had been released to the public intentionally because only the police and the killer would know that. And at this time, this is when they realized Mary was the one who had killed Martin. Mary's friend Norma was questioned and very quickly admitted to the murder, but said that it was all Mary. And on August 8th, 1968, Mary Bell at 11 years old was charged with murder. Detectives were stunned by Mary and her intelligence level and how clever she was and how conniving she was. And she seemed to be able to anticipate their questions before they even asked her the questions. She had her answers ready before they even had the question out of their mouth. And the police were just as disturbed as everyone else. They had never encountered someone so young committing such horrific acts. There's something about a child killing a child that is just disturbing on a completely different level. But this was back in the early 60s and they probably had never known a child who had killed another child before. And it was all very disturbing and difficult for the police officers to take in and really comprehend that Mary really had killed these two little boys. 
normally in England, the accused is sort of put in a separate box area by themselves. They don't actually sit with their lawyer. Um, but because of Mary's young age, they allowed Mary to sit with her attorneys. And as the trial was going on, Mary was very nonchalant. It was very, almost as if she didn't understand what she was being charged with. She was seen constantly asking people for candy and she would be dancing beside her seat. And it, it was, she was just completely unaware of the magnitude of what she had done and the fact that she was on trial for murder. But again, she was 11. So what level of comprehension, like what does an 11 year old know? Can an 11 year old really understand these things? But then you also have to ask, can an 11 year old really commit these things? And unfortunately, yes. The trial lasted nine days and the prosecutor, Rudolph Lyons, initially started by linking the two cases. Handwriting experts were brought in to link the notes found in the nursery to Mary and Norma's handwriting. And it seemed as though they had samples of Mary's writing and Norma's handwriting. And it seems as almost as when they were writing the notes that Mary would write one word and then Norma would write one word and then Mary would write the next word and on and on and on. And it's, it's such a chi childish thing to do. It's something little kids probably do. <laughs> the jury was also told how horrible Mary was to these little boys' families. She taunted them, asking to see their bodies, asking if they were sad, if they cried, and really excitedly enjoying finding out about the pain that the families were experiencing. Forensic evidence was brought in in the form of clothing fiber linking Mary to both murders and Norma to Brian's murder. Through the trial, it became clear that Mary was the dominant one and Norma was the submissive one following along. Psychiatrists that examined Mary diagnosed her with psychopathic personality disorder. Mary demonstrated a lack of empathy and a lack of impulse control. And to the best of scientific knowledge, there is no cure for psychopaths. It's no matter how much therapy they get or a medication they're prescribed, it's a personality disorder. It's not a mental illness and it's not something that's believed can ever be cured, which is very concerning knowing that right now, Mary's walking around England under an anonymous name. No one knows who the hell she is and no one knows what the hell she's doing. So that's a little frightening. The jury deliberated for five hours and Norma was determined to be considered simple-minded and was found not guilty of everything. Mary was found not guilty of murder, but she was found guilty of manslaughter and Mary was sentenced to a lifetime of detention. The jury heard nothing about Mary's home life and all of the abuse she suffered. None of that was taken into consideration by the jury because they were never told about any of it. And because of Mary's young age, authorities really wanted to try to rehabilitate Mary rather than punish her because she was so young. She committed these murders at only 11 years old. She wasn't even a teenager. She was still a child. So they really wanted to find some way to rehabilitate Mary and be able at some point to have her back out in society, which she now is. And she was, she was too young they didn't really know what to do with her. They didn't know where to send an 11 year old girl. They couldn't send her to a regular prison because that would definitely be too dangerous. They couldn't send her to a mental institution because she was too young. All the options that they have, it was just none of them worked for Mary because of her young age. 
So they decided to send her to a reform school and that's where she went and she was given constant attention, which I really think is what Mary needed. It was, I think the one thing she always craved that she never got. And this is just a personal thought, but I do think she in a way committed these murders for attention. She wanted people to pay attention to her. That's why she talked so much about the crimes. It's, it's so difficult because your heart breaks for her in the childhood that she had. Like it's so disturbing, the abuse that she suffered. Mary spent 12 years in a juvenile detention center with 22 boys and she was the only girl. And she continued the entire time she was there to blame others and not take any responsibility for her crimes. And she really blamed her mother. And I have to say, I can understand. And she wrote a letter to her mother when she was in this detention center. And I just wanna read it so I get it um, perfect. <laughs> so you get exactly what she said word for word. It says, please mom, put my tiny mind at ease. Tell judge and jury on your knees. They will listen to your cry of please. The guilty one is you, not me. I am sorry if it has to be this way. We'll both cry and you'll go away. Tell them you are guilty, please, so that mom, I am free, your daughter may. And it was written in a rhyme, the way a child would write something. And I do believe, I believe Mary got the sentence she deserved, but I also believed, very strongly believe that her mother should have been punished for something because when you go to the nature versus nurture, obviously Mary was probably born with some type of predisposition because she also had an older sister who I would assume, I don't know, I don't know anything about the sister and she probably just doesn't want to be involved in any of this, but her sister probably went through the same abuse and she didn't turn out to be as a murderer as far as we know, because we know nothing of her sister. Um, but even though she had that predisposition, if she wouldn't have suffered that abuse, I don't believe that she would have committed those murders at age 11. And Betty later gave a TV interview and it was very clear that she was suffering from alcohol and drug addiction at this time. And probably I would assume most of her life, but I have zero sympathy for Betty. Any person that can inf inflict that type of abuse on a child, I have absolutely zero sympathy for. Absolutely none. So how Betty is, how Betty dealt with this, I honestly don't care. I think she created this and she was never held accountable. And I don't know exactly how they would hold her accountable, but I don't know why she couldn't have been in charge for the abuse. But I also don't know in, this was happening in the late 60s. I don't know what the laws around child abuse were at that time. So I don't know legally what she could have been charged with, but I do believe she was very much, I would say almost equally to Mary, responsible for what happened to those two four-year-old little boys. In 1980, at the age of 23, Mary was released. She was given a new identity and she had had a daughter while in captivity. And I really hope that child was conceived consensually. Um, I really researched and tried to figure out like who, how did Mary end up pregnant? Who was the father of this child? And I really couldn't find anything. And Mary's daughter deserves her privacy. And what ended up happening was Mary was given a new name and identity. And someone ended up finding her daughter who was 14 at the time. And when whoever it was that found the daughter 
told her about the abuse Mary had suffered, the crimes that Mary had committed. And I can't imagine at 14 years old, learning all of these things about your mother. And eventually Mary went to court and she got a new identity for herself, for her daughter. And then eventually Mary's daughter had a daughter. So Mary's then granddaughter was also given a new identity. No one knows where they are. No one knows what their names are. No one knows what they're up to. I have a question. Is somebody watching her? Like somebody, is anyone watching her? Because she was just let out at 23. And I just feel like someone like Mary, maybe that's someone they should keep an eye on. Like she's out there living her life. And hopefully she's doing well and her daughter and granddaughter are doing well, but we'll never know. I mean, she's not going to identify who she is and she shouldn't, I, you know, she was 11 when this happened. And I do think she should have been given a new identity and she should have her privacy. But I do also think authorities should be keeping an eye on her and I don't believe they are. And we'll never know. The thing about this story is the story, no matter who's telling it, the whole story is always about Mary. It's not about the two little boys that she murdered. And it's hard to find information about the two little boys. They were four years old, Brian Howe and Martin Brown, both, as I mentioned, four years old. And there's not a lot to say about them because they were four. Like how much information is there to say about a four-year-old boy when their parents speak of them? They speak of how delightful, how loving, how energetic, how sweet. Like their parents speak very lovingly about them. But these two little boys lost their lives. They never grew up. They never became adults. And who knows what they could have contributed to the world. So I think as much as it's interesting to hear about Mary, it's also important to honor these two four-year-old boys who really lost their lives because of Mary. And in my opinion, because of Mary and Betty Bell, but that's just my opinion. So thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Hope all you beautiful souls have an amazing day and I will see you next week with next week's upload. And next week is an interesting one, I have to say. Definitely recommend if you like the video, like it, subscribe if you'd like to see more from me, and turn on notifications so you'll know when each video is uploaded. Thanks. Have a beautiful day.